Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6. If you need a Bible, shoot your hand up. We've got guys that are going to bring one out to you. Now, we've been talking as we've made our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. It's been such a great journey for me. I hope it is as you as well. We've been talking about, and I'm not going to beat this too much, but it's important for us to remember how the first three chapters, Paul reminds us of our identity. This is who we are as Christians. Our identity, this is, is in Christ, and it now affects how we live in community. And so he's talked about how the, being a Christian, it affects how we interact with the world, the, the unbelieving world, and, and, and out there. He talks about how uh, we interact within the church itself. Last week, if you were here, we talked about marriages. Like, what does it look like for a born-again couple, a spirit-filled followers of Jesus? How does their identity as Christians affect their lives as wives and husbands? And this week, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 of chapter 6, which expands that, and it talks about children and parents and family life, and then transfers also into uh, our work life. What's it look like between employees and employers? And so as Christians, this is where we spend, this is where most people spend our lives is at work or with family. And so as believers then, as Christians, this is the primary places at home and at work where we are living out what we believe. This, this is practical Christian living right here because we're only at church for a few hours a week, right? We're spending 40 hours a week or more, or whatever, at work. So this is important. And so this is what living as God's people is meant to look like. It's just real practical stuff. Now, Paul begins by saying, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, there's this cycle that kids and parents go through uh, where, you know, when you're like zero to five or something, your parents can do no wrong. And then uh, you guys already probably know where this is headed because you have experienced it. And then there's, you know, like five to 10, 11, 12, where now they know most things, but not everything. And then it just like completely hits the brakes during the teen years and maybe the early 20s where parents don't know a darn thing. Once you're 20, Again, maybe that you, well, they start progressively to learn more, right? And then by the time you have kids yourself, man, mom and dad were pretty wise if I come to think of it, right? Well, Paul says the first thing in this parent-child relationship to get is that children should obey their parents. He says this is the right thing to do. This seems very old-fashioned. Even this, it, it shouldn't be. But even saying that children should obey their parents seemed, seems old-fashioned in today's world. You know, a generation or so ago, uh, it wasn't like that. You, you, you turn on the, the TV, right, and families and parents were portrayed as wise and worthy of your obedience. Be, you know, Beef, when he listened to Ward and June Cleaver, Things went well for him. Some of you are like, I've never heard of uh, Warden June Cleaver. <laughs> Leave it to Beaver, man. It's, when he listened to mom and dad, it went well. Or uh, little Opie, when he listened to his pa, Andy, there, it kept him out of all sorts of mischief, right? And, but today, if you watch a TV show, they have the parents, and especially the dads, they're portrayed as fools. They are out of touch they are dumb. They're idiots. You know, uh, Charity has mentioned before. She just scowled at me. I was like, "Sorry." I don't know what you're gonna say. Oh, okay. I don't know either. <laughs> but you know, you know, it's like this stereotypical: the dads in the blinds, you know, caught up, and you know, it's like he's as dumb as a cat, you know, kind of like, "Oh, now I'm gonna offend the cat people." <laughs> wow. there, there's more offense coming. I, I hate to say, but it, it's no accident that Satan wants to undermine the family. Because what God is for, Satan is always against. And the foundation of marriage and family is from the very beginning. 
And it's something that God is very much in favor for because he knows how healthy it is for us. And so it's something that the enemy is extra active in counteracting. And this has never been more evident in the days that we're living in right now. And we, even as Christians, we have to be very, very careful because our enemy is subtle. He will use things that even sound good, that we can agree with you know, the way it sounds or it seems positive, and, and he'll use that so that he can accomplish his end game, his agenda. Now, if I offended the cat people, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> my intent is not to offend this morning, but I'm also not afraid of offending. And I don't need to tell you that the world we're living in, that Black Lives Matter, receives a lot of favorable attention. 60% of Americans say they support Black Lives Matter movement. But one of the tenets of the Black Lives Matter movement, one of its stated goals, is to disrupt the nuclear family. Up until about two weeks ago, you could go to their website, blacklivesmatter.com, and read right on there that one of their goals was to disrupt a, a home that had a father and a mother with his children. Now, they've since faced some backlash and taken it off. But don't take my word for it. You could, if, you, if you doubt this, you can go find a screenshot of it and see it for yourself, that this is part of that Marxist type of mentality. And there is a push right now that Christians have to stand against. To, the, the, they, the, the enemy wants to break up the family, but family is good for us. Parents are good for us. And sometimes you don't realize this until you're older. But it's the truth. We know this, right, deep down. The Department of Justice released these statistics from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless and runaway youths. 71% of high school dropouts. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions. 75% of adolescent substance abuse. And 75% of rapists are by homes without a father. Now, if you're a single mother here this morning, don't misunderstand. Don't, don't think that I'm saying you need to just give up. There's no hope at all. But what you should do is make sure that you're plugging into an environment like this, that you're surrounding your, your child with positive male role models. Because God doesn't tell us to do something that's bad for us. He only tells us to do what's good for us. And family is good for us. And part of a family that's living in harmony, the way that God has designed it, is for children to obey their parents. In the Lord, it says. Now the question is, what does in the Lord mean? What's he, what's he talking about? Is, is the in the Lord talking about the parents? Is it talking about the rules? Or is it talking about the kids? If he's narrowing it down to the parents, you need to obey your parents who are in the Lord. Like, is he saying that unchristian parents, you don't need to worry about them. You know, just pff, whatever they say, just blow it off. Or is he refu referring to the instructions given by the parents? If they're giving you instructions, something about the Lord, that is what you need to obey. There's a parallel passage in Colossians chapter 3. And I'm not going to turn there, but I encourage you to jot it down in your notes, put it in your margin, because it ties so closely in to this passage here. But it kind of clears up where Paul is heading and what obeying uh, parents, what, what the, the child is supposed to do. It says in Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. This is how a kid is to, it, it, the kid that's in the Lord, walking with the Lord, is to interact with their parents. Unless, obviously, it's, con it's uh, contrary to God's word. Children are to obey their parents. He says that's the right thing to do. And again, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about wives submitting. You know, I'm just, I'm offending every week here lately. But we talked about this last week, how it, there's not an inferiority thing when we talk about submission and obeying. Because Jesus himself, by whom all of creation was made and for whom creation was made, uh, yet Luke 2 tells us 
that he was subject to. He submitted himself. Depending on your translation, he obeyed Joseph and Mary, his father and mother. And so for the family to live in harmony as God designed it, children are to be obedient to their parents. And he says there's blessings in obedience is what Paul is going to remind us of next. Not only are children to obey, but verse 2, they're to honor their parents. He says honor or esteem, revere your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Not only are children to obey their parents, they are to honor. I love having my own son just like, boom, right there. It's perfect. (laughs) If I don't look at you this morning, forgive. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) But honoring here, he says, you know, obey and honor. Honor is different, different than obeying, right? Because you can obey, but still do it resentfully and bitter and mumbling under your breath. I can't believe that guy. But to honor your parents is to decide, it's to make a conscience decision to treat them with dignity and courtesy and respect and value. It's a willful decision. Now, what it means to honor your, your, your father and mother is going to change as your parents age, as you age, but the principle still remains that that is a calling on people's life, is to honor their father and mother. Now, obviously, there's a challenge involved here, right? The challenge is what do you do if you have a miserable parent or parents? They're not worthy of honor, right? Some of you have referred to refer to my wife again. Uh, Some of you have heard stories about Charity growing up and how physically and emotionally abusive her father was and the pain that was involved in that. It can be really, really challenging to honor a miserable, terrible parent. And and you say, they don't deserve it. That might be true. But what this doesn't say, there's a lot to be said in what it doesn't say. It doesn't say you have to agree with your parents 100% of the time. It doesn't say that you must enjoy hanging out with them every waking hour. But you still need to honor the fact that God chose them to be your parent. And you can still honor them because it's a choice. And so for the child that learns to honor and obey their parents, Paul reminds them, hey, I'm going to take you back and remind you of the promise in the fifth commandment, that there's going to be long life. Now, when I was going through through this and thinking about this, it's kind of like maybe one of your parents said, I brought you into this world. I will take you out, right? And so, well, then to honor, yeah, it's going to preserve my life because mom's going to take me out. Now, the command to honor your father and mother, it comes with this promise that obedience and honoring them is, is, is going to bring you blessing in your life. You know, live long and, and prosper is kind of what it says here. But what it doesn't, what it doesn't necessarily mean is that it's going to give you a quantity of days, but a quality of days. I like to think of it as you're going to have a full life. Instead of a, a long life, you're going to have a full life. Children who listen and learn from their parents' wisdom and experience, they're going to avoid all sorts of painful and destructive consequences. I've said to my kids so many times, and I can think of specific instances in which I've done so, I said, I wish I could give you all the things that I've learned through experience. All these lessons, because I haven't, I've lived a rough life myself a little bit, right? I wish I could just take all of the stuff that I had to learn a hard and painful way and just give it to you so you can avoid all that pain, all that hardship and heartache. But I can't. I can't give you my experience. All I can give you is direction and instruction. And so you can't live my experience, but you can listen to my advice. That is what you can do. And so children... When you honor your parents this way and listen to the godly things they have to say, Paul says it's going to bring blessing to your life. God has given you parents to bring you guidance and wisdom and support and protection. And children in the Lord are to obey and honor them. Now, this instruction to honor and obey parents does not give mom and dad a free reign to become dictators in the house. 
and say my way or the highway. Parents have their own responsibility. It says in verse 4, And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't tear down your kids. Now, I find this really interesting and telling that Paul doesn't say anything to mothers here. This is specifically for men because I think from my own experience, I know this is true about me, that dads are a little bit more prone to do this. He says, dads, don't, don't push them towards wrath and, and resentment and bitterness. And I think the NIV says exasperation. Don't, you know, just keep hounding them with those things. Again, the parallel passage in Colossians 3 says, fathers don't provoke lest they become discouraged. The New English Bible says, don't goad them to resentment. Don't prod them towards resentment. That doesn't mean as a father that we're not to hold our children uh, accountable. We are. But don't push them towards, don't escort them towards resentment. And, And dad's talking to you right now. We do that through hypocrisy. Do as I say, not as I do, right? We do it through critiquing more than complimenting. You're not doing this right. You're not doing this right. Dads, you remember being a kid. That's not fun to hear all the time. But we're prone to this, even though we know that. But Charles Swindoll gives a list of things that can goad their children to bitterness. Unreasonable demands for perfection. Constant nagging over minor infractions. Abuse. Failing to leave room for freedom of expression public embarrassment, and inconsistent discipline. Now that's hard, inconsistent discipline. There's no set boundaries in the household. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason what dad is saying. It's all arbitrary. There's one day this is so wrong, the next day it's no big deal, and vice versa. To a child, that's frustrating. And some of us, again, we remember that. I remember that in my own life. And so Paul is saying, since this submission and honoring thing is a willing decision for the child to make, you have your part in, 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 in not running a home that's going to lead your child to not do that, right? You need to become a dad who's honorable to be honored by your child. Now, Paul says, instead of provoking, which tears down your child, instead of doing that, he says, fathers, bring them up. Or as the King James says, nurture them or or build them up in training and admonition of the Lord. The Greek word here for bring them up is the same word used. If your Bible is right there, look in verse 29 of chapter 5. It's the same word used on how a husband should nourish his wife. I really like how John Calvin translated this little part here. He said, uh, speaking of fathers towards their children, He said, let them be fondly cherished. We sometimes, dads, we think that's mom's job to do that. But nurturing is part of your responsibility. Now, the word describes cultivating. Do that which increases one's value. It's creating an environment and an atmosphere in your home where your child can thrive. And parents, he says, This is how you do that. This is how you nurture. This is how you create an atmosphere where your child can thrive. We do that by training and admonition in the Lord. Now, let's talk about these two words, training and admonition here. Training speaks of discipline. Kids need to be disciplined. Another not too popular thing to say these days. Kids need discipline. Proverbs 13, 24. Most of you guys are familiar with this. You've heard this before. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But whoever loves him is diligent to discipline him. We are to be diligent to discipline. Not not eager, not excited, but diligent, steady, consistent, diligent to discipline. Because discipline is necessary for raising kids the way God has intended. And, And not only for raising kids, but for raising us. We, we experience it as Christians, right? Christians, the book of Hebrews says, whom God loves, he chastises, he disciplines. This is how God raises us. And so, like the Lord, we're never to 
discipline out of rage or anger. Our discipline is to be born out of this nurturing, this cherishing, this fondly cherishing attitude towards our kids. Now, along with the training, parents and fathers in particular are to admonish them. Now, this word means to instruct or teach, to encourage or warn. It's not just telling them what to do. It's telling them why. This is why to, we are to do it. And this is important because kids don't need a lesson. Maybe you've noticed this. We read it in the psalm this morning. <laughs> kids don't need a lesson on how to lie. They learn that one really, really quick. How to steal, how to be selfish. They got all that down. But they do need to be taught how to be good. How, why to be good. These are things that we're to instruct our children in. And in fact, Deuteronomy 6 verse 7 gives instruction for parents on how to raise your, your kids. It says, you shall teach them diligently God's law, God's perspective, his rules. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, all the time. This is how you are to be raising your kids. Now, parents, and again, fathers in particular, if you are in the picture, you are to lead your children in and to the truths of Scripture. This is part of your responsibility, Paul is saying. And, and you can say, well, I can't give them a Bible study. They're going to think I'm so lame. They're going to think I'm boring. They already do. <laughs> You're not parenting your child to be your little buddy. We like that, right? But that's not why you parent. Your parenting is to train your child how to live successfully on earth and in heaven eternally. That is the goal of your parenting. And so these two, training or disciplining and admonishing or teaching, they go hand in hand in building up a child. And so he says, raise them, nurture them, guide them, love them. Do that the way that God does with you. He's faithful, he's patient, he's consistent with you. That is how you're to raise your children. Now, Paul goes from speaking of home life, now we're going to transition into work life. He says in verse 5, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Now, if you have an, another translation... It may say slaves. And critics of Christianity will jump all over this and say, well, look right there. The Bible condones slavery. The Bible supports slavery. Let me just tell you right now, it does not. If this is something that you hear from an atheist, a skeptic, an agnostic that is critical of the Bible, it does not teach slavery. In fact, in Exodus 21, verse 6, it says, He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or he is found in his hand, he shall cer certainly be put to death. The Bible has a whole book in the New Testament. Granted, it's a short book in Philemon. But how a born-again slave and a born-again master, how they should interact with one another. And Paul says, hey, Philemon, don't treat him like property now he's family. That's what the Bible teaches. And so the Bible doesn't encourage or teach slavery, but it also recognizes that it exists and existed in society. Historians estimate that at the time Paul wrote this, between 25 and 40% of the population of the entire Roman Empire was slaves. And so Roman... Slavery could be very cruel at times, it really could, but it certainly wasn't the slavery that comes to our mind when we think of slavery, because it wasn't based on racism. It wasn't, I'm, I captured this people, and now I'm just going to put them to work until they die. It was more socioeconomic. It was... Uh, there were some political prisoners, but most of the slaves of this 25 to 40 percent were indentured servants. And so they weren't exactly slaves like we would picture that, but they weren't altogether employees like we would picture that e either. And so even though there's a difference between how Paul's uh, economic system worked and ours, 
the principles between a laborer uh, and, and the boss or the owner still ring true and they're still applicable for us. And so he says, bond servants, employees, we could say that, uh, would fit right in there. Be obedient to those who are your masters or bosses, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, respect, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. So Paul, uh, first Paul says to the worker, the employee is to obey the boss. This is the exact same word and responsibility that a child is to have towards their parents. An employee, and if you're a boss, you're like, yeah, uh-huh. An employee is to do what they're told, right? Any bosses give me an amen there? Like, that's what they're supposed to do. Unless an employer is telling you to do something that's illegal or unethical or that's, you know, safety thing, it, it's a direct contradiction to God's word, you're responsible to do, with what, do what you're told. Paul goes on in verse 2 and says, not only are they to obey, they're also to work with integrity. Not with eye service as men pleasers, not trying to impress as someone else and working hard when the boss is around, right? And everybody knows what this looks like. Everybody has seen this or everybody has partaken at some time in this where it's leaning on the shovel or the broom to, oh, here's the boss, you know, getting back to work. We've all seen it. We've all been a part of it. As soon as the boss comes, everybody get busy. But as Christians, that's not how we're to operate anymore. Our work ethic isn't for show. It's not something we parade out there. Paul is calling us to have the same work ethic whether the boss is there or not. If there's a camera on the wall that just filmed you, it's hidden the whole time, you wouldn't be working any differently if the boss was there or not. Because even if the boss is gone, Paul says God is with us, and that's ultimately who we're working for. Third, laborers are to work like they're serving Jesus. Verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. You're not, you're, this, is, this is something that's ingrained in you because it's service. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. How we do what we do when we're working is a powerful witness to our coworkers, our bosses, because ultimately what we're doing is we're serving Jesus. We're to work as to Christ. We're his bondservants. They're slaves to him. And so how we work is a good reflection of what's going on inside of us and who we are and where our relationship with Jesus is. If we're slackers, if we're lazy, if we're just punching the clock, it's going to be evident but if we're walking with the Lord, we should be working like we're working for Jesus. And so you're fixing that pool like you're working for Jesus. This is Jesus' pool, and I'm fixing it for him. Or I'm pouring that concrete like I'm, this sidewalk is for the Lord. Or I'm, I'm fixing that car, fixing that bus. I could go around the room and pick you guys' jobs out. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm pulling this person over. Like I'm pulling over Jesus, that man doesn't make quite work. <laughs> but whatever you're doing, you're doing it like you're doing it for the Lord. It's all for him. And as employees, if you're an employee, right, we understand that at the end of two weeks or a month, we're going to be rewarded with a paycheck. But that paycheck is going to be here and gone tomorrow, right? But for the believer, Paul says, don't be so short-sighted. Paul reminds us that the Lord is going to reward us eternally for faithful obedience. Look what he says in verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, so broad, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So number four, for the, the laborer, for the worker, for the employee, is to remember your reward. Ultimately, we're not working for the paycheck. We're not working for the praise of people. We're working for the glory of God. And he will not be a debtor to you. You are going to receive your reward. There's a story, and some of you may have heard this before, of a missionary and his wife that were coming back from Africa on a boat years and years ago after serving faithfully for 40 years. At the same time, unbeknownst to them, Teddy Roosevelt was on this same boat, traveling on the same ship after a two-week hunting safari. Upon their arrival in New York, this missionary saw 
the red carpet rolled out, saw the band playing. It was like, wow, after 40 years of service, and then realized it was for Teddy Roosevelt. Like, he just went shooting animals for two weeks. I've been faithfully serving for 40 years, and he got dejected, and he allowed himself to feel bitter. But yet in that moment, the Lord spoke to his heart and said, my son, you're not home yet. Your reward is still coming. That boss won't always appreciate you the way you should be appreciated. He's not going to give you all the attaboys you deserve. You might get passed up for a promotion for someone that's less deserving, but God will not forget the work you do, and you will be rewarded. Verse 9, And you, masters, bosses, employers, Do the same things to them, giving up threatening. First, bosses, you're to manage with character. Paul says, you're a master. I recognize that you have this position of authority. You're a master, and so your positions are different. But actually, you have, as a Christian, the exact same calling as the slave. This would have been so radical to an empire with up to 40% slaves to say the masters had the same calling as the slaves? Everything I said about your servants, uh, that applies to you as well, master. Just as your employees are to serve you, you're to serve them. You're to be honest with them. You're to respect them. You are to, to, to serve them. And just like your employees are working for the Lord, you're managing for the Lord. And so do it like I'm there. Like you're doing it for me. And don't threaten them. Don't take advantage of them. Why? He goes on and says, knowing, it's a reason word, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Second bosses, he says, remember that you're accountable to God. You and your employee have the exact same master in heaven. So don't be overly harsh. Show some grace. You have some authority here, but I'm the one with authority over both of you. So you're accountable to me at the end of the day. Third, bosses, owners are to exhibit humility. He goes on to say, uh, your master also in heaven and there is no partiality with him. There's no partiality with God. Your rank, bosses, employers, it doesn't matter to the Lord. It doesn't matter one bit to God, whether you're the employee or the employer. He doesn't care if you're a master or the slave. He doesn't care if you're on the top rung of the corporate ladder or if you're an intern just trying to squeak by. Your wealth, your lack of wealth, has no bearing on him because every single human being is valuable to him and you're going to answer to him. And so there is a word here in practical Christian living for everyone that every, and what we ended here with is that everyone is valuable to God. There's no partiality. 